hands unto him. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. He gives it to us now, for free. How you can make the word of God flesh to you. So we talk about, and what I'm going to talk about this morning is simply grace-based prayer. Praying from grace, we touched on it a little bit last week, but praying using words of grace. Praying using words of grace that you believe. There is a word of grace, right? And, and then you are expected to believe this word of grace. You pray the word of grace and you believe that which you pray. So that's what basically we're going to be talking about uh, today. Now, so uh, come with me. Uh, let's start uh, from, well, let me see. Go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 29. The book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse we're going to read the B part. That is what applies to us. It says, where the Lord is far from the wicked, the B part says, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. A wicked person is somebody who does not believe in Jesus. I listen to me here. It's not necessarily a wicked act. Sometimes we think acts determine the nature of a person. And now it is not that. Your nature is how you were born. And so you can be born with the nature of a righteous person and once in a while, act wickedly. That doesn't make you less righteous. Or you can be a wicked person by nature, born that way, somebody who's not saved, and once in a while, act righteously. That doesn't make you righteous. You follow this here? Your righteousness is based upon your birth. That's why when we are born again, we are righteous. If a person is not born again, they are wicked. And the Bible, Lord is far from that wicked person. Would you say then that if you are righteous, the Lord is near you? Yes. Praise the Lord. And so how does a righteous person pray? What should he pray about? What should he be saying? Now come with me to Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Mark 11, verse 24. You all know this. Therefore I say unto you, unto you the righteous, okay? What things soever you desire, when you pray. Who is saying this? Who is saying this? Jesus. He says, therefore I say unto you, righteous people, word of life, hello. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, let's keep it on the screen for a second. It says this here, what things soever you desire. Would you agree with me what you desire is the answer? Amen. Right? What you desire is what? The answer, not the problem. You already have the problem, you don't want it. Yeah. What makes a problem a problem is that it is something that you don't want, you don't like. A desire, on the other hand, is something that you want or you like, right? And so Jesus said that when you pray, pray what you desire. And, and what you desire will be filled with grace. And so you go to God. God says that, if I hold on to this, go to Hosea chapter 14. Hosea chapter 14, verse 2. In the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 40, verse 2, he said, Take with you words 
and tend to the Lord. And so the words that you tend to the Lord should be words that when you tend to the Lord, the Lord wants to hear. God does not want to hear your problems. I mean, you, you, you'd be surprised. You would think that God wants to hear your problems. You know why? Because as far as he's concerned, he has given you solutions to your problems. And so when you turn to him, he wants you to turn to him with the solution. He says, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the cars of our lips. So when you turn to the Lord, turn to the Lord with words, words that will, will be seasoned with the words of grace. God wants to, you know the reason why is that? If you go to God and all you do is to talk to him about your problem, you're telling him that he hasn't solved it. Now, it's very interesting about how God works. He's already solved your problem before the problem arose. <laughs> it's not when you got your problem that God then has to work out to solve the problem. God has already solved the problem. We call it the finished works of Jesus Christ. Everything that God does, he, he has, that God will do, he has already done it. And so as far as God is concerned, it is in past tense. So when you go to God to pray a grace-based prayer, you take the words of God as if they have already happened. Did you get it? That's what God wants to hear. God, your word says, God says, all right, let me hear. That's what he wants to hear. You don't go to God and God, oh, my problem is this. He doesn't want to hear that. Remember when Moses went to Jesus, uh, to Jesus, went to God, Jesus, and, and was telling God, look at these uh, Egyptians, they're after us. He was crying unto God. And what God said to him, if I go to um, Exodus chapter 14, let's pick up from verse 12. Exodus 14, verse 12. It's not the word that we did tell the Egyptians, saying, let us alone. This is when they saw the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites said to, to Moses, it's not this the word that we did tell the Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. What is that, the problem? Would you agree? Amen. It says, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, than that we should die in the wilderness. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Amen. What is that? The answer. Stand still. The answer. And see what already God has done. The salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For Egyptians, the problem, whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. What? Forever. Verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you. I love that. <laughs> The Lord shall fight for you. Now, if the Lord is fighting for me, I don't have to fight. And you shall hold your peace. It's almost the same thing uh, uh, Joshua, who succeeded Moses, told the children of Israel when they were walking around the walls of Jericho. God told them, hey, I want, what, when you just go around the walls of Jericho every day, one time, and when you do it, don't say anything. Hold your peace. And imagine the people that saw them and looking at them and said, what is wrong with these people? Is that how they're going to take the city, walking around it, and quiet, not saying anything? They think by that they're going to take the city? They found out, didn't they? Did they take the city? They did, right? And we found out last week that Rahab had said to, to the to the spies that Joshua had sent to them, that indeed the terror of the Israelites had fallen upon them. God had already, before they got there, if I go, go to uh, um, Joshua 2 9 quickly, I just want you to see that we are living in the past tense. <laughs> Grace based prayer is prayer that takes the past tense and brings it into the present tense. Not the present tense trying to get into the future tense. Did you get it? If, 
Ooh, boy, I got I got myself here. You see, if, if you <laughs> if you looking at getting in the future, that is not grace based prayer. If you look at it, that is in the past, and what you are doing is that you bring what is in the past to the present. It's a whole different story. Amen. Did you get me? Did you get it? Amen. If you are looking to get it into the future from your present. It's not a grace-based prayer. You're trying to get God to do it in the future as you're praying about it in the present. God says, I've already done it. Amen. And so you are going into the past and fishing what is in the past and bringing it into your present. Now faith is. And so every time in your present, you're bringing the past into the present. You bring in what has already been done. Healing, done. Okay, if it's done, how do I get healing that is done to come into my present? Well, that's what the message is about. We'll get into that. Favor, done. How do I get the favor done in the past into my present? Now that favor, I want favor in the future. If you do that, you are not doing it in faith. Are you getting me here? It's interesting when, when, uh, got so many places to go. Uh, it's interesting when God told Abraham, I have already changed your name from Abraham to Abraham. I have made thee past tense. Right? Amen. I have made thee what? Past tense. And then Abraham has to come into the present. So when he meets somebody, and he introduces himself to that person, he tells that person, I am the father of many nations. That's what his name means. Amen. At that time, he was not the father of Isaac. He hadn't had Isaac yet. Did you get it? Amen. But his introduction, is somebody say, okay, you shake somebody's hand, my name is so and so. He's telling people, my name is the father of many nations. And so he's taking what God said, I have made thee, past tense, and now brought it into his present. And what happened? He had a child, didn't he? Oh, praise the Lord. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord had given you, past tense, the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. And yet, unfortunately, if you go back to where we were, uh, in Exodus, the Israelites were complaining. They were allowing the, 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 the problem to so infuse them that they could not see themselves as having already been given the land to possess. So what was happening is that they were, they were looking at the circumstance and they had determined their state on the basis of the circumstance. You get me? Do you get me? And that's what sometimes we do. We allow the things that are happening uh, in our lives in the present to change the past. The past is past. It's already been done. You can't change the past. Now, in, you know how you cannot, they tell you this, stop crying over what? Why? Because you cannot get the milk spilled back in the bottle. Oh, if you get the paste out of the toothpaste, you can't get it back in. Just brush your teeth with it, that's all. And so you can <laughs> If something is in the past, you cannot do anything about it. And that's why it's in the past. And so what God wants us to do is to bring what is in the past with us, not to try to change the past. Oh, my God. I hope you get this. I hope you get this. All right. Now, so here we are. We're talking about grace-based prayer. Now, we learned last week that everything that God has done, he's done it in the past tense. We looked at some of the scriptures. Let's go to quickly uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and let's look at verse 4. So whereby are given unto us pastors, right? Isn't it? 
uh, uh, exceeding great and precious promises that by this you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so we have received these precious promises. As far as God is concerned, he has given them to us. Pastors. So what you're going to do with it is the issue. You don't go change the precious promises to doubt. You can't do that. What you do simply is that you got to make sure that that which has now been given to you, you make every effort to really experience it. Praise the Lord. Now, let's, give, let, let's go to another place and, 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 and see how it is that this works. That uh, Let me read one more. Let's go to the scripture above. Verse 3 first. I, I should have read verse 3, getting to verse 4. So according as the divine power had given unto us, again, pastors, would you agree? Amen. Anytime you read the Bible where something has been given to you, don't pray to get it. Amen. In fact, what you pray, if you're going to pray about it at all, say, thank you. That's all. You know, thank you is prayer too. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But it says, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, through the knowledge of Jesus. And we learned in this series that we've done on grace that really Jesus is also grace. Because the Bible tells us grace and truth came by one whom? Jesus. And so, and so Jesus is letting us know you got to have a knowledge of him. you got to have knowledge of grace. In fact, let me go to another place. Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Listen to what the scripture says there. It says, And now, brethren, word of life, brothers and sisters, I commend you to God and to the word of his what? Grace. This is what it says, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. You see that? And so if I get the word of grace, in that word of grace is my inheritance. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. In the word of grace is my what? Inheritance. Amen. Say it again. In the word of grace is my inheritance. So you wonder whether somebody is going to die and give you something. <laughs> Uh, some kind of loving uncle, loving dad, a loving aunt, whomever. Hey, listen, you already have an inheritance that is out of this world. Because he says that the word of his grace is able to give us our inheritance. Now, I want you to understand that. That there is an inheritance from God to you. And the best one, I read this and it blessed me. God says that we, he is our inheritance. For, you think about it. When people are seeking to inherit things, we inherit a person. Because without a person, you get everything. And so he says that, God says that he is our inheritance. But you're going to find out about your inheritance through this word of his grace. So that's where we're going. So, and so in a simple sense, so, uh, let's find out uh, what I said about what prayer is as we go along. Prayer is an everyday expression, everyday expression of how much you need God and how much you trust him. How much you need God and how much you trust him. Lord, I need you, and I trust you for supplying all my need according to your riches in glory, not according to my skills, not according to my hard work, and you should do all of that, but nonetheless, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, another way to look at prayer is this. Prayer is you taking your place as a receiver. Prayer is taking your place as a receiver and giving God his rightful place as the giver and provider. Let me say it again. Prayer is you taking your place 
as a receiver. That's where sometimes our problem is. The word of his grace, you don't have to be qualified to receive. All you have to do to receive is to believe. Because, because any other way under the Old Testament, you qualify first. You remember, you remember when uh, uh, Moses was taking his uh, family to Egypt? And you recall when uh, they were in, in the inn, right before they would enter into Egypt, in the inn, in the wilderness, and the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared unto, unto them and, and almost uh, uh, struck dead the, um, Moses' sons. And immediately, immediately Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and did what? Circumcised those boys. In a sense, God was saying, if you want to qualify for your deliverance, be circumcised. You can go and get, <laughs> you see why I was reading this to Pastor Clarissa last night and prepared my message, and we both laughed. Remember the story, I'm going off the plantation again. Um, <laughs> uh, you remember when, uh, you remember when the, um, What was I about to say here? <laughs> oh, in the book of Acts. You remember when uh, the children, the, 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 they called them the Judaizers. These were uh, Christian believers who were Jews, who had been circumcised, who had followed the Mosaic law, but then got saved. And when they got saved... Uh, they found out that the, Greek, the Greeks, in this case the Gentiles, also had gotten saved. And so they go to the Gentiles and they tell them, if you want to remain being a born again believer, you need to be circumcised. And these are grown men. And it's one thing women to be circumcised when you are a baby boy. But if you are a man, it's a whole different story. <laughs> In fact, um, we'll come back to this. Go to Acts chapter 15. Let's look at this. 15, quickly, quickly, verse 1. Acts 15, verse 1. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and except, when you use the word except, it means it unless. That without it doing this, you cannot have that. You have to qualify. Except qualifies. It says, except you be sacrificed after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. You see that? It's a wow. I was doing okay when I received Jesus. <laughs> when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I didn't know I got to be sacrificed on top of it. Oh my God. <laughs> and verse 2 it says, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. No small, but intense argument came up between Barnabas and Paul and the rest of the people who were trying to tell the, these Greeks, these Gentiles, they have to be circumcised. So they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of men should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. It was so serious that they sent a delegation to Jerusalem to find out whether they had to be circumcised. Next verse. And being brought on their way by the churches, okay, uh, and declaring the conversion of Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Verse 4. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received with the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Verse 5. But there rose up certain other sect of the Pharisees which believed. These are Pharisees that got born again. And, and at one point, Jesus said that if you want to be righteous, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee. They were very devoted, dedicated to the Mosaic law. And then, of course, some of them got born again. And so they couldn't pull themselves away from the tradition. Now, how is it possible that God, you had us circumcised, and we believe and we accepted Jesus, and, and these people are coming in? Who were no people of, no people, you didn't have any relationship with them. They're com coming in, and you are accepting them without being circumcised? So that one, it says, but there rose up certain other sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise. Needful. 
When something is needful, you say you can't get out of it. That water and, 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 and air that you have to breathe. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. It was needful to circumcise them. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. Next verse. And the apostles and elders came together for, for to consider of this matter. Next verse. And when there had been much disputing, much. Women, when it comes to circumcision, men would dispute. It's not an easy thing to go through. <laughs> and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's all you need to do. Hello, not, not to qualify any other way. Next verse. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. They believe and they got the Holy Ghost like we did. That's what I said. Next verse. And put no difference between us and them. Praise God. No difference. Purifying their hearts by faith. Next verse. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? You see that? Wrong doctrine tempts God. It's a wrong doctrine. Why are you tempting you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? So you know the disciples are not only those 12, because they're referring to Gentiles who were not even at that time uh, when Jesus was around uh, involved in the ministry at all. Are you listening to me here? And so they are therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? It simply means followers which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. We couldn't do it. And of course, you know, it, it, it's not only circumcision here. Because if you're a baby boy, as I was when I was circumcised, I don't remember. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. Hello. And so if there's something else I can bear, as this is saying here, it must be something else in addition to the circumcision. Did you get, did you get it? It's their guilt. It's very difficult to bear guilt. The guilt that they could not do what God was asking them to do. And God did not intend for them to really accomplish what the Ten Commandments was requiring of them. He just wanted them to know, you cannot do it without me. That's all. Next verse. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved as they are. That's all. Through the grace. Grace is the finished work of our Lord. And through that finished work, we shall be saved. That what he does is what saves us, not what we do. Yeah. Oh, you can clap on that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's what you did for us that saves us, not what we do for ourselves. Oh, praise the Lord. Next verse. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles, spared them. Next verse. And after they had held their peace, James, who was Jesus' half-brother, answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon or Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agreed the words of the prophets as it is written. Listen to this. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down, and I will build again the reserve and I will set it up. And, and, and the tabernacle, oh, uh, don't have the time to go. I'll get to it next time. Next verse. Um, I want to get to this point. Uh, I'll get in a minute. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, say the Lord who, are, who doeth all these things. Next verse. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Next verse. So wherefore my sentence is this, that would trouble not them. Leave them alone. Which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Leave them alone. Next verse but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication, from things strangled and from blood. Next verse. For Moses of old time had never seen them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Next verse. 
Then please aid the apostles and others with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barabbas, namely Judas, Sonim, Basabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. And they wrote the letters to say simply that, listen, it is all about Jesus. You don't need to qualify in order for you to receive anything from God. If you do it through Jesus, that's all you need. And so the word of grace when it comes to prayer is prayer based upon what Jesus has done, not based upon what you do. Now sometimes we think we have to fast and we need to fast. But don't think that fasting is what will make God answer you. You can fast and have still a wrong doctrine. I know people will fast and have wrong doctrines. Hello? Okay, so where were we before? Acts 22, thank you. You are paying attention, praise the Lord. Acts 22, okay. And so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. The word of his grace says it's all about Jesus. So let us find out what did Jesus say at one time when he was here concerning that. Go to John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 13 and 14. John 14, 13 and 14. The word of his grace. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Oh. Whatsoever you shall ask my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Next verse. You shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So now, would you agree and, and I, I wrote something here that I want to read it to you as to what it means by praying in the name of Jesus. Now listen to this. I hope it comes across the way the Lord gave me. Praying in the name of Jesus means that Jesus will honor any prayer that he will have prayed himself. Did you get it? Praying in the name of Jesus means that Jesus will honor any prayer that he himself will have prayed. And, and he is the one who said he only spoke what his father gave him to say. So if he prayed, he prayed only what his father gave him to pray. And so if we pray in the name of Jesus, what we are praying, praise the Lord, it's exactly what Jesus himself would have prayed if he would have prayed. Oh, glory be to God. There is no limit to the power of prayer in the name of Jesus. Go to John 16. We're going to look at verses 23, 24, and then I will now get to some things I want to get to before we leave. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. Very, very, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name. So what we do is that we ask the Father in the name of Jesus, and he says the Father will give it to you. Now, a good question that you want to ask is this. Why would the Father give it to us when it's already given to us? See, that's how I read the scriptures. That's how I read the Bible. I have a very discriminating analysis of the Bible. I read already where it says that, that we have already been given all things that pertaining to life and godliness. And so why would Jesus say here that you ask the Father in my name and he will, that puts it in the future, isn't it? He will. Would you agree? Are you here? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> and so obviously there is something that Jesus is saying here. Don't forget at this time he has not gone to the cross. He has not said as he said on the cross what? It is finished. And so quite often what we have to do is to go to the epistles to really get a sense of what it is that God wants the local, the, I mean the church, the local body, the body of Christ, I should say, should be acting on 
is in the epistles. It's not even in the four gospels. It's in the epistles that we go to to find out what it is that God has already done for us. When Jesus came, he came to prepare the way so that he can say it is finished so God can give it to us. Did you get it? So don't let this throw you off in case you read it when you go home and you say, well, it doesn't match what it is that God said earlier and as we quoted it in 2 Peter where he has given unto us all things that pertain unto God, uh, to life and godliness. And here he says he will give it uh, if we ask in his name. All right, praise the Lord. Did you get it? Amen. Okay, let's move on. Now, so the next thing that we have to do is that there is a word of his grace, but there is a way to get into that word of his grace. First, you have to know that word. The first thing that we have to do is to know the word of his grace. What does the word say about the situation I'm in? What does the word of grace say? Well, does it say anything about favor? Yes. And so if I'm going to look for a job, I have to claim ownership of the past work that the Father had done through his son Jesus that qualifies me by what he did for me to obtain favor. Did you get it? And so if I have that favor, I can actually be courageous enough to step up to the plate and to believe that whilst I'm going to look for that position, for that job towards my career, that I can expect to get it. Why? Because I can go to the Father and say to him, Father, it's in the past tense. It's a done deal. You said that indeed that your favor surrounds me like a shield. I have your favor. And because I have your favor, I can expect this favor to manifest in my life. So as I go forward to look for this position, I'm going with your favor with me. I believe that you will give them the questions and give me the answers to those questions. I believe that when I step up there, they will see me as an asset to that establishment. Did you get me here? You, you have to talk yourself up. Man, I, I was, okay. Go, go to, um, go to, well, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, let me wait. So let's see about the word of his grace. When you get, you got to know the word. You must know this word. It is important to study the word. That's why you, when you go to a church, you got to go to a church where you can hear the word taught so you can know. Because if you don't know the word, how can you have faith for it? How can you believe that? The scripture says, for example, no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. Amen. You think about that. Amen. You know, it's not, like, it, it, it's not like there will be no weapons formed against you. Right. There will be, but even if they are formed, they will not prosper. Yes. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. It, 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 it is an attitude adjustment. I call it renewing your mind to the word of grace. When you hear it, sometimes it sounds so outlandish, so off the wall, like Michael Jackson's uh, album, Off the Wall. Oh, so, <laughs> so off the wall that you, you imagine how is it possible for what God has said to be true? Are you listening to me here? How, how can you possibly expect this to happen? The scripture says, and let's look at this in... Uh, Psalms uh, 35, verse 27. Listen to this. It says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. And the only thing that God wants from someone that proves to God that that person favors his righteous cause is believing on Jesus. You know, in my meditation, studying the word yesterday, this is what I got. That when Jesus came, the one thing he wanted, and the reason why he went to Israel, instead of any other nation in the world, 
Have you thought about it? Why didn't he go to India or China or come to America? Or go to Europe or go to Africa? Why did he go to Israel? The reason why he went there that God caused him to be born there, number one, is because God prophesied that he would be born there. And so when he got there, when he was born and he started his ministry, the one thing that Jesus wanted above everything was for him to be believed. That he is the one. Because unless you believe him, he can't do anything for you. And so he went to the very place that the people there, by the knowledge of the word, would have known that he is the one. Amen. Did you get it? Nowhere else were they told when they were coming up that there's a Messiah coming. There's a Messiah coming. He will be born in Bethlehem from the line of David. Nowhere else other than Israel. And I look at something, as I said, look, look, look to me, look with me to... Um, uh, John chapter 7. And let's start from, because of time, uh, it, it, it's just fascinating in terms of talking about Jesus being, uh, wanting to be, um, to be believed. Let's start from um, uh, verse 40. Okay, it says, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, oh, uh, truth, this is a prophet. Now, the reason why some were saying that was that Moses said that a, a prophet would God raise unto them just like he is. And for him, they, whatever, if I go to uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, I have five minutes. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Uh, 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 go to Deuteronomy chapter, what did I say? 18, verse 15, quickly, so you can see this. Why, why only in Israel could this happen where the people can believe in? The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. You see that? Amen. Did you see that? Amen. Are you here? Yeah. Be, be, be excited, my goodness. Amen. Uh, amen. So the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Yeah. And so he has to come from their midst, from Israel. Of their brethren, like unto me. So you be a man like me. Amen. Unto him ye shall what? Hearken. Now let's go back to uh, where we were. Uh, John chapter 7, verse, verse what? 40, I said. Okay, John 7, 40. Quickly. It says, uh, many of the people, wherefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is a prophet. Referring to what we just read there. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? Okay, all they said, this is the Christ. It's referring to the Messiah still. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Galilee. This is what threw them off. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Go on, next verse. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? And you and I know after the fact that indeed that's what happened. Amen. They didn't know it then. Because they didn't know how Jesus was born. Did you get it? So there was a division among the people because of him. Next verse. And some of them would have taken him, and I look at what uh, taken him in another translation, is arrested him. Why did they want to arrest him? Because he was claiming to be the Messiah. Amen. And they didn't think that somebody from Galilee could qualify to be the Messiah. And some of them will have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? One who told you to go arrest him. Why did you come back without him? Next verse. The officers answered, Never man spoke like this man. <laughs> Case closed. Never man spoke like this man. So Jesus was a man. Yeah. Uh, he was all God, but he was all man. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Next verse. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Yeah. 
you know, a person who is a deceived person is someone who believes in a lie. They were the ones who were deceived, not these ones who were coming to tell them that no man spoke like the way Jesus spoke. Okay, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Next verse. But his, these people who know not the, the law are cursed. Okay? Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, remember, uh, Nick, right? Be one of them. And he said this. Next verse. Doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? You can go and arrest him if you, don't, if you haven't given the chance to, for him to represent himself. Next. Then answered and said unto him, listen to this. This is what, this is what God them. Are thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. That's not true. Because in the scriptures, it was said that, that Jesus would be a Nazarene. And Nazareth is in Galilee. So they didn't know the word like they thought. They answered and said unto him, Are thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. And it's true, most of the prophets came from the south of Judea and all that. That's true. But the point about it is, is that they, they missed their visitation and, 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 and thereby failed to believe on Jesus. And all Jesus wanted was for these people to believe on him. Did you get it? Amen. And that's all, because the moment you believe him, you qualify now to receive everything that he did for you. Yes. Did you get it? Everything that he did for you. Give me five more minutes to, to finish this. Okay, so you have to hear the word, know the word of grace, and you have to also uh, renew your mind to it. It may be outlandish, it may be off the wall, but you got to believe it. Because God said it, it is true. Amen. And we're about to read Psalms 35, verse 27, and we'll stop in the middle of it. And, and all I want to share with you is that, uh, that let, let him shout for joy. And he says, let the Lord be magnified, which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. So, so why, why keep God from being pleasured? God says, I take pleasure when you prosper. And so obviously, he wants you to prosper. So this is what he did. He says, he has blessed us with all what? Spiritual blessings. And in Proverbs 10, 22, it says this, that the blessing of the Lord, it does what? It maketh rich. It has no sorrow with it. And so as far as God is concerned, when he blessed you, he also prospered you and made you rich. And, and you think about it, you say, how can it possibly be? How can I be rich? Making a minimum wage. How can I be rich without even a job? So you're thinking naturally. You remember the lepers? Lepers who were hungry, dying, about to just give up on life. And somehow or another, God used them to defeat the Assyrian army when they began to walk. And God turned the ginger walking of lepers, soft walking, leprous. They have sores all under their feet and over their bodies. They can't walk briskly. Four of them couldn't walk as loud as the chariots of horses that Assyrian army heard and took off because they thought the, the king of, of Israel had sent for the Egyptian army to come and defend them. Are you getting me here? God is able in one day to turn your life around supernaturally. 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 Just one day. Praise the Lord. Wasn't it the case when one day a couple walked into this house, watched over when we were stretching our hands to believe God for death freedom, and the man tells his wife, I hear the Lord tell me that we should help paid it off, and did they do it? Yes. That, that, that is what supernatural. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. One day, there was, a, there was a, a, a auction being held across the street. Hello? And all we had to do was step up to the plate, pay the $10,000 for two and a half acres of that land over there, 
And then the next day they come back, send us the check back, give us the assets free, put everything on that. What, what is that? Is that natural? Is what? Supernatural. And then again, here it is. We got a contractor coming to us saying that we can, we can find a way to build this in debt free for you and you pay as you go. What do you think is going to be? Supernatural. Everything with our God is supernatural. 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 And, and he would do it in a way that it would surprise all of us. That's how we are supposed to walk. Oh, glory. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I believe God. I trust God. And he will find a way to give glory to his name. Praise the Lord. That's why when we pray, we say to him that we want you, oh God, that, that build this church for your glory. So we can stand up here and say, it is not our doing, but it is the Lord's doing, and it is the marvelous in our eyes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen, every once in a while, we have to encourage ourselves. Every once in a while, we have to believe that God that we are serving. If you don't do that, you will miss it. You will be weighed down with the pressures of the moment. And I know, I go through it like you all. I was telling Pastor Carissa that when we were having Bible study last night, I said, listen, uh, you know, sometimes you go through it, I go through it too. I just hide mine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're a leader, you know, you got to find a way to present that everything is okay, even when everything is burning. <laughs> Hallelujah. To his glory. Jesus. To his glory. Jesus' glory. To his glory. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, O Lord. We exalt you, O Lord. We magnify you, O Lord. We praise you, O Lord. We worship you, O Lord. We glorify you, O Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Give thanks unto him. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. He gives it to us now. How you can make the word of God flesh to you. 